Uh, Turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17. Exodus 20, verse 1. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have other gods besides me. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, because the Lord will punish anyone who misuses his name. Remember to dedicate the Sabbath day. You are to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the foreigner who is within your gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the sea and the earth and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. Honour your father and your mother so that you may have a long life in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony against your neighbour. Do not covet your neighbour's house, do not covet your neighbour's wife, his male or female slave, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbour. This is the word of the Lord. Well, keep your Bibles there, grab a newsletter. There's an outline there in the newsletter and uh, make sure that you keep along there. I'll keep an eye on the time and see whether we've got time for questions at the end. Thanks, Alan. Can you fix up my technology, mate? Sorry about that, mate. (laughs) You're terrific. Uh, I want to begin, actually, uh, by quoting from one of my uh, favourite musicians. Uh, The man's name is Shai Lin. Uh, He's a rapper, a Christian rapper, who happens to be a minister in Washington, D.C. He's actually got a song called The Jealous One, which really uh, I would prefer to play because I actually think it's probably a better sermon than the one that I've put together. But I want to begin, thanks Alan, I want to begin with a part of one of his verses. I couldn't think of much worse if I tried than a dude who smirks if you flirt with his bride. So tell me, what kind of God would he be if he wasn't bothered to see idolatry? Is God just supposed to laugh and withhold his wrath when he's replaced by a golden calf? It captures the goodness of God is jealous, doesn't it? God is jealous. He's jealous for his most precious and valued relationship. He's jealous for the one he loves. He's jealous for the good of that one. And God is jealous. It's a good and grand truth. And we're going to look at it today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for music. Thanks for your word. Thanks that so often they go to, together in a way that stirs emotions and imprints memories. Our Father, thank you for the truths that we see in your living and active word, which is the revelation of your nature. Uh, as we come to a truth that might be slightly strange to us with words that we use differently. Help us to know the goodness that you are jealous. Jealous for your people because of your reputation. Please apply it to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, We began this series, I'm at point two on the outline, we began this series of God's attributes with God is, can you remember the first one? God is holy, but simply God's unique. Remember the platypus? There's nothing, there's no one like him. Uh, In his description forever, in Revelation 4.8, he's described as holy, holy, holy. No one like him forever. It's a description that we hear on earth, Isaiah 6 verse 3. The result of that is there is no more significant thing or being in the universe than God. No more significant thing or being. And because of that, God will not let anyone or anything take that significance from him. Isaiah 48 verse 11. God will not give his significance to anyone or anything else. 
Uh, God displays that significance, his uniqueness, by creating the world. No one else can do that, can they? By speaking and it comes into existence. In fact, in God's word, we're told that his creation of the world is for the purpose of displaying who he is. There's nothing like him, Revelation 4.11. And in this world, he made his representatives, humans, male and female, to bear his image throughout the whole world. Humans wanted God's significance, didn't they? And they wanted his significance, and so they wanted to decide the course of the world despite God, in spite of God. And that attitude and action that wants to be God instead of God is called sin, and God handed us over to that. Genesis 3, see how it goes for you. God himself committed to restoring both humans and the world so that people would know his significance. He decided to do that through the family of which man? Abraham. Through Abraham's mob, God would restore the world. That's the background for God is jealous. That point three on the outline. God is holy is the background to God is jealous. Abraham's mob have been saved by God from slavery in Egypt. We're going to remember that, aren't we, in a few weeks on Passover night as we share in roast lamb and flatbread. God himself has displayed his uniqueness in public acts. He's humiliated the Egyptian gods, hasn't he? That's what the plagues are all about. Who's the boss? Who's most significant? It's not Ra, the sun god. It's the one who made the sun. And Abraham's mob have been brought out to meet with their god at Mount Sinai. And there, if you like, they've had a wedding ceremony, haven't they? A public event where a covenant is established with serious consequences. And there we're told that God has given his people a job. Exodus 19, 1 to 8. You're going to represent me to the world, just like I created humans to do way back in Genesis 1 and 2. You ought to show the world what God is like. There is no one like him. And Abraham's mob gathered together as a nation called Israel at the foot of that mountain all say what in response to that? We will do everything you say. So that they can carry out that job, God gives them ten words. And those ten words outline his nature. We know them as the ten commandments, don't we? And we've just read them. Crucial for understanding those commandments is Exodus 20 verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Notice the salvation comes first. They're saved to do a job. And then God gives them these ten words so they know what he's like. Now we save them, this is what they're representing. And in Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 to 6, can you go to the next slide, please, Seamus? Exodus 20, verses 4 to 6, we have the first mention of God being jealous. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below, or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down in worship to them. Do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children to the third, fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Do you notice God's word there? The devotion he deserves is not to be given to anyone or anything else. Why? There is only one Lord your God, and he is jealous for his reputation. They're in a binding covenant. God's mob have the job of showing his significance to the world. God is jealous for his people as they show him to the world. God is passionately and single-mindedly committed to his mob as they display him to the whole universe. Anything that undermines that, provokes his jealousy. Just look again there, and we can see a number of ideas that are bound up in what it means for God to be jealous. Worship, give God what he deserves. Worship, give God what he deserves. Idolatry, giving something else what God deserves. Idolatry, giving something else what God deserves. There's there's no one like God. He is unique. 
nothing more significant in the universe. And God is unrelenting and faithful in his commitment to his mob as they do this. When we say God is jealous, and I'll come up with a couple of other aspects of this definition in a moment. When I say that God is jealous, he is passionately devoted to his people, single-mindedly, so they can represent him to the world. So they can show the world what he's like. And anything that distracts or dilutes God's people from that tells the world what they think of God. Tells the world what they think of God. And do you notice that has a generational impact? As one generation watches the other and sees what it means to be devoted to God. So here are three summaries I found this week of what that jealousy means. It's God's unique commitment to his significance that shows itself in the salvation of his people. It's God's intolerance of a rival or unfaithfulness from his people. It's God's right demand of exclusive worship. The Lord is the God of his people. And his people proclaim and practice his significance to the world. And now we get an immediate example of that. Not long after what we've just read in Exodus 20, to get you guys to keep going through the slides for me, please. Moses comes down from talking with God. He's been up on the mountain for a while. As he comes down, he hears some noise at the foot of the mountain where the rest of God's mob are gathered. And they've been tired of waiting. And so they've decided that they'll make something worth worshipping. Uh, They're going to make a golden calf because that's a right representation of God, isn't it? Their proclamation and practice so to the world what they think of God, doesn't it? Moses smashes those stone tablets with the words and God himself says, I'm not going to go with my mob. They're stubborn, they're stiff-necked. They they can go into the land, but I'm, I'm not going with them because they are divided and lukewarm. And then Moses steps in. If your presence does not go, Moses responded to him, don't make us go up from here. How will it be known that I and your people have found favour with you unless you go with us? I I and your people will be distinguished by this from all the other people on the face of the earth. Our job is to represent you, God. How will the world know you if we don't dwell with you? That's our job. There's something distinct about God's mob. They're unique, just like their God. They're bound to God in a binding, eternal, everlasting covenant and God is jealous for them because they show his name. Uh, That's seen a little later in Exodus 34, 14. Next slide. Because the Lord is jealous for his reputation, you are never to bow down to another God. He is a jealous God. We see it several hundred years later when God's people are gathered in the land a God has been gracious and gone with them, uh, except they've kept the same habit of being unfaithful. Their whole existence shows to the world what they think of God, and God keeps calling them back. He uses special men and women called prophets to do that. Uh, one of the prophets is a man called Hosea, and God commissions Hosea not just to proclaim but to practice. Listen to Hosea 1 verse 2, the next slide. When the Lord first spoke to Hosea, he said this to him, go and marry a woman of promiscuity and have children of promiscuity for the land is committing blatant acts of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. Hosea, go and marry a prostitute. Hosea, be unfailingly devoted to her. Be faithful to her and you will be a living, breathing example of my relationship with my people. Gomer is consistently unfaithful to Hosea. Hosea chapter 2 verse 5, as she wanders in her public display. Their mother is promiscuous. She conceived them and acted shamefully for she thought, I'll follow my lovers, the men who gave me my food and water, my wool and my flax and my oil and my drink. Gomer is saying publicly, God's not enough. I just need to hedge my bets. I'll go here for my food, I'll go there for my drink, I'll go here for my leisure, I'll go there for my career, I'll go here for my savings. Uh, And what do you think that says to the world as Goma sleeps around? 
God's mobs sleep around. God's not worth it. God's just one of a, a, a number of options that I have. Hosea is so faithful to his wife. If you read the book, he buys her back literally. He expends a fortune on her. All his precious possessions to keep buying her back because he loves her and she's unfaithful. Just like God. God loves his people. God is unfailingly committed to his people. God is unstinting in his love for his people. He gives them all that they need and they sleep around. Uh, it reaches a, a really deep point in Hosea 4, 6, the next slide, as we see what the neglect by God's people leads to. And my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I'll, I'll reject you from serving as my priests. Since you've forgotten the law of your God, I'll also forget your sons. You notice the echoes there from Exodus? Priests and children. You, you see, God's people have wandered from him so much that they now know him by name but nothing else. I, God's my husband, but I don't know him because I don't spend any time with him because I sleep around. God is jealous. God is unique. His significance will be given to no one else. His people represent him to the world. And God's people have a history of being continually unfaithful. Uh, we understand that imagery of a wandering spouse, don't we? Isn't it, the way Shailin picked it up? A husband who smirks when someone else flirts with his bride. That resonates. The goodness of a rightly jealous husband, we understand that, don't we? We expect that, don't we? A rightly jealous spouse, we, that resonates. The consistent inability of God's people to be faithful, that resonates painfully, doesn't it? The failure of God's mob to truly represent him, that resonates, doesn't it? That echoes. But there is one, I'm at the next point in your outline, there is one who is faithful. There is one who represents God truly. There's one who does not wander. There is one of God's mob, just one, just one. Listen to John chapter 1, verse 18. John chapter 1, verse 18. No one's ever seen God, the one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side. He's revealed him. What's, what's that one's name? That's Jesus. He truly reveals God as he is. He's God in the flesh. And do you know what? Jesus is passionately jealous for God. In fact, in John chapter 2, verses 13 to 17, we see that the Jewish Passover was near, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling oxen, sheep and doves, and he also found the money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their sheep and their oxen. He also poured out the money changers' coins, overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that it's written. Zeal, passion for your house will consume you. How dare you treat God like that? How dare you represent God like that? And so Jesus, who actually fulfills the second commandment perfectly, then goes to die for all those who don't. Jesus always gave God what he deserved. And so through God's most precious possession, God saves his people. So now they can represent him to the world. Now let me remind you of an old memory verse, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, which is the next slide. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession. So you may, what, what may we do? Proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you are not a people, but now you're God's people. You'd not receive mercy, but now you have. Same pattern, isn't it? Not saved to represent God. Exactly the same as Exodus. Saved to show God to the world. Same God, same people, same job, same jealousy. And so when we get to the end of all things, and I won't read this one, but Exodus 
chapter 19, the next slide. God's people are represented and prepared to be the right bride for his boy because he's made them pure. God is jealous. He's jealous for his significance to be displayed through his people. That's the reality right through God's word from Genesis 1 to the last word of Revelation. And as God's people saved by the one who did this perfectly, God is jealous of us because of his significance. In view of what God has done for us, we're to give back to him what he deserves. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, the next slide. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, what do you present to God? Worship. What, what's your worship? What, what does God deserve? God deserves all of us. All of us. Flesh and body and mind and soul and deed and word. And it will stand out. It will stand out. It will not conform to the world, but it will conform to the knowledge of God's will and it will show God to the world. And do you see how unlike Gomer that is? Do you see how unlike Gomer that is? In fact, James goes further. In that reading from James chapter 4 that Steve brought us earlier, James 4, 4 to 5, you ad- he's writing to God's mob. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. Or do you think it's without reason that the scripture says the spirit he made to dwell in us is intensely jealous? Could it be any starker? Could it be any stark? God is jealous. There is no one like him. He has no rivals. He is unique. He is the most significant in all the universe. His people represent him. That's what we're made to do. We fail dismally, don't we? But thankfully Jesus didn't. Thankfully he did that job and so we're still given this job today. So what what will it look like on Monday morning? I'm at the last point on the outline. Uh, I think if we listen carefully to what Steve read, uh, these are the two obvious things that come out. Uh, Tomorrow morning, please be realistic in your assessment of who you are before God. Uh, We're in God's mob, and I struggle to represent him as he truly is. I'm going to wander tomorrow. I'm going to wander. My devotion will be directed elsewhere. I'll give my consideration and my energy and my wholeheartedness to so many other things. And what will that say to the world? And so in that realism, we need to repent. We need to turn back to our God daily. We need to repent and turn back to the one who is most significant. And when we do, we can rejoice. Why? What will God do? He'll forgive us. He'll forgive us because Jesus never wandered. And so we'll get on with reflecting God to the world, be restored and God will redirect our devotions and desires. It will also involve a painstaking assessment of how passionately we really are daily. Not because when we do this assessment we suddenly do good deeds to get right with it. We're already saved through Jesus. Saved completely. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't examine our hearts daily. An article I read this week said, why don't you take a stock take of your time and monetary devotion? Actually, just spend seven days writing down how you spend your time, how you spend your money. If you did that stock take, you might also cover how much you post online and what it looks like, how much your social interactions, take your devotion, or your sporting devotions, depending on whether it's summer or winter. What what do your hobbies take? Uh, How about your nationalism and your political allegiances? Uh, What about your cultural warfare and your leisure devotion? Uh, It it will also assess the cross-generational impact we might have to the younger generations as they look at us and how we display God. Uh, Let me tell you, if I did a stock take like that, I I can only speak for me. If I did a stock take like that, 
I might see the same deadly devotion as Gomer. That my practice and my proclamation shows that God is one of a number of my devotions to the point where I might be seen to know him by name but not by nature. What does our daily individual communal practice and proclamation say to the world about how significant God is? What is he? He is unfailingly devoted in relentless love to his mom through Jesus. And as I take a stock take like that, I'll be driven to repentance. And as I'm driven to repentance, God will kindly restore me in Jesus and then I can joyfully go and show him to the world. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, It's a tricky concept. God is jealous. And we thank you for your goodness in bringing it before us. Uh, There is no mistake that you are. And Father, we pray that saved already by Jesus, who is jealous for you perfectly, saved by him, you'll redirect our devotion, you'll redirect our emotions, you'll redirect our desires so that we will faithfully proclaim and practice you to the world as the most significant. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.